Warm greetings to one and all. Welcome to part one of American Heroes, the Montana Freemen. Today, very few people know much about the Montana Freemen. And for those who may have heard something about them, they only know the story as it has been filtered by the establishment media. The official story, articles which parrot the same thing, populate the internet. Most people only know what they've been told. Do your own internet research and what you're gonna see, you're gonna find headlines and articles using terms like armed and dangerous, white supremacists, militia, domestic terrorists. There have been books written about the Montana Freemen. You'll also find several attempts to tell their story via videos from third parties who have studied them. But today, you're going to hear the story as told directly from Dan Peterson, who is considered one of the leaders of the group, working right alongside Leroy Schweitzer. You'll follow along in my discussion with Dan as we discuss the many aspects of who they were and what they did and why they achieved such notoriety. Now, I can also speak with some authority on the subject. I have spent time with all of them. This was prior to the standoff, having made the trip uh, to spend a few days in their classes and learn what I could from them. This was both in the cabin in the Bull Run Mountains, south of Roundup, Montana, and then again later after they moved to Jordan, where the standoff occurred. That's the ranch house you see in all the pictures. Of those still alive, Russ Landers is the last one still in prison. He and his wife Dana spent a good amount of time working with me in Colorado. This was back in the days when we were active, learning and practicing issues surrounding our people's one Supreme Court of the county, which is the Supreme Court for the people. These are things we learned from Leroy and the Freemen. Fantastic research they did to bring forward on these issues historical evidence, and procedures. Now, Russ, Russ was serving a 20-year sentence emanating from the standoff. Now, that would have been over by now, and he'd be out, except he was searching for truth, and all he could find, all he ever uncovered, was fraud, corruption, and abuse. The government took offense to his efforts and paperwork sending out notices, trying to achieve justice, trying to correct the wrongs that were being committed. And they tacked on another 20 plus years on top of the 20 years he was already serving. He's a classic case of one who never hurt anyone, a, a kind spirit, a God-fearing, peace-loving patriot, who is living out what amounts to be a life sentence in prison for seeking the truth, which the government deemed to be a threat. Until now, the best account of the story so far has been Pat Shannon's book, The Montana Freeman, The Untold Story of Government Suppression and Media Cover-Up. And I recommend the book. If you want to learn more, get into some details. It's a great book. It gets into a lot of aspects that you won't see anywhere else. In fact, I'm going to read to you just an excerpt from Pat's book as a way of introduction, okay? So we'll cut right into a middle of a paragraph here, and he says, We wonder how Dan Rather can justify calling them a hate group, when after years of confrontation, there is yet to be a bloody nose or a black eye. On what grounds can Ted Koppel call them racist hustlers? Why is this a criminal matter instead of a civil one? The free men, so named by news people because of their signatures on the court documents they filed, were followed by the title, quote, free men character, unquote. That's free man character. And they began to sequester themselves on the Ralph Clark Ranch in the fall of 1995. This was in Jordan. This fear was provoked by the arrest and incarceration of rancher Bill Stanton, one of their own. And on March 25, 1996, two of the men 
whom the government called the leaders, were captured and taken to jail in Billings. The ranch was surrounded by federal agents for the next 12 weeks. The public learned little of what the group was really all about, but Redden saw numerous degrading and demonizing newspaper and television reports about the individually questionable character and moral turpitude of these people. When it came to the issues at hand, we heard only that these people were criminals who had written bad checks, threatened judges, and filed illegal liens on various elected and appointed officials in various branches of government. Ear tickling buzzwords such as white supremacist or separatist or extremist or radical, racist, anti-Semitic, militia member, anti-government, hate group, paint vivid negative pictures for the reader. Inaccurate as these may be and often are, the mass media succeeded with this deceptive practice, at least for a while, in Ruby Ridge, Waco, Oklahoma City, and then started working again in the same modus operandi in Montana. The rest of the world really doesn't understand what's going on and why. But it's easy to assume that these must be some very bad and dangerous characters to command this much manpower against them. More than 600 agents of the FBI were on the scene for two weeks or longer during the 81 days. The freemen have been labeled and libeled. But just exactly for what do they stand? Did the federal government abuse their rights? What are their beliefs? And just what provoked this unusual sensation and situation that has now landed them all in jail? Is the Freeman side of the story so complicated that reporters cannot understand enough of it to even attempt to cover it? Or has there been a blackout? End quote from Pat's book. Now, we're going to attempt to lift the blackout. We're going to attempt to give you the real story, not from a third-party observer, not from a news reporter, not from someone who studied the issues, but you're going to hear directly from Dan Peterson, one of the leaders of the Montana Freeman, as I speak with him. Now, before we begin, let me give you the context and the mood of the times leading up to the famous standoff. Let's start with the Gordon Call story. Call was a poor farmer in South Dakota. He had no money to speak of, didn't even make enough to meet the threshold of being required to file. He was poor. He didn't file for many years, and he was never bothered by anyone. He wasn't required to file. He didn't make enough money. One day after not filing for about nine years, because he wasn't required to, he went on a radio show, and he stirred up a hornet's nest. The radio station started getting more calls than they ever had from people saying they agreed with Call. He's right. They weren't going to file anymore either. And these calls kept coming and coming and coming. He really stirred it up, and that did it. He was now a target. The feds went after him. Long story short, they put him in prison for a time. He did his time, and he got out and went back to his life. End of story, right? No. The feds weren't satisfied. They summoned him again to court for another attack, more harassment, more intimidation. And he basically told them to take a hike. He ignored the summons. Didn't show up to court. That was his crime. One thing led to another in a story which reads like a very dark and gruesome horror story from Stalin's communist Russia. After being successful in evading intensive tracking and surveillance, he was snitched on and the feds caught up with him. Now, did they arrest him, put him back in jail again? Would be logical, right? No. They didn't do that. This is what happened. A Delta Force team flew out special in a private jet from Washington, D.C. with orders to kill him. 
Now, they had plenty of opportunities to take him peacefully when he was in town, moving around, and other places. But no, they waited until he was in a remote rural area in the evening hours, and finding him inside a house, they removed the woman who was in the house with him, and they laid down a horrific barrage of firepower intended to kill him just flat out. Now, the house was well constructed, made primarily of concrete. He survived. They went in the house, they found him alive inside. They tortured him, knocked his teeth in, took the butts of rifle, rifles and smashed his face in. He had broken bones and bruises everywhere. They then, listen to this, they took an ax, they hacked off his left hand. Screaming in pain and bleeding profusely, that wasn't enough. They then hacked off his right hand. And they proceeded to hack off both of his feet. That wasn't enough. They then put a bullet in his head from close range a local deputy sheriff was given the honor of removing the bullet from Gordon Call's head as a souvenir. To cover their tracks, they tried to burn the place down, but due to the fact of its concrete structure, they didn't do a real good job at that. The corpse identified as being Gordon Call's was missing teeth, hands, and feet, had a bullet hole in the head without a bullet, and was extensively covered with tissue bruises and fractured bones. It was very shocking and disgusting. As some of the local people who saw the photographs of Gordon Call's charred remains, which were taken by the coroner, they reported a stark and terrified look on his charred face. He had died in extreme terror screaming violently from the pain. And the feds had gotten their man. Then we had the Ruby Ridge Massacre near Naples, Idaho, which was an 11-day siege, started on August 21, 1992. The feds had previously set up Randy Weaver by sending him a stooge to buy a gun from him. The Fed buyer said he wanted the barrel of the rifle to be just a little bit shorter to fit his case. And he asked Randy if he could cut off a small part of the end of the barrel, which Randy did to accommodate his buyer, thinking nothing of it. The Feds got what they wanted, an illegal firearm. They brought up Randy on federal firearms violations as a result. And again, just like Gordon Call, Randy ignored the summons. Didn't want to go to court. Said, just leave me alone. Get out of here. Don't, 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 don't bother me with this bullshit. He told him to get lost. Leave him alone. That's all he wanted. Just live in peace with his family. The feds would have none of it. Armed FBI agents stalked the house from the surrounding woods. 14-year-old Samuel was out in the woods one day with his dog. The dog sensed the presence of the feds and went on alert. The feds shot the dog. Samuel turned and fled in panic. The feds then shot 14-year-old Samuel in the back and killed him for fleeing. That was his crime. That started the standoff. During the standoff, sniper Lon Horiuchi was perched up behind a rock on the hillside with a clear view of the house. Now, I don't believe this is a photo of Lon himself. Lon was an FBI agent. This photo is of a state police sniper, although it's interesting to note the uh, Japanese name Horiuchi uh, and the ethnic uh, features of the guy in this photo. So if you see this guy, leave him alone. <laughs> but so Randy's wife comes out the front door. 
holding their newborn baby. Horiuchi had a clean shot. He pulled the trigger, killed Vicky with a single shot right through the head while she was holding her baby on the front doorstep of her house in their cabin in the woods, trying to live a life and be left alone. Randy eventually surrendered, went to prison on minor charges. The jury acquitted him of all the major charges that they were trying to get him on. Uh, he later sued the government. He won an out-of-court settlement for $3.1 million. You think this made him happy? You be the judge. I met Randy after all of this a couple years later at a preparedness expo, and he's just a normal, decent, God-fearing man. Just a, a, a guy you'd love to have as a neighbor. Friendly, outgoing, talkative. He just wanted to be left alone, and yet the government wouldn't allow him not to be dominated. They wanted to dominate him and everybody else. They would not allow him not to be dominated, so they blasted his son, his dog, and his wife to pieces because they can. Then the Waco siege happened about a year later. That also ended, uh, that ended uh, on April 19th, 1993. The Branch Davidian group was suspected again of weapons violations, causing a search and arrest warrant to be obtained by the BATF. And a siege was initiated by the FBI, causing a standoff to start, which lasted 51 days. The official story says the FBI launched an assault, were engaged in uh, gunfire, several of their people were killed, and they later initiated a tear gas attack in an attempt to force the Branch Davidians out of the ranch. Well, you'd think, okay, force them out, take them into custody, sort things out in a more calm environment, right? Logical, sure. However, we have evidence, film evidence, which shows a specially fitted tank with a specially fitted tube affixed to the turret penetrating the outside wall of the building and inserting some type of incendiary gas, which was then ignited, which caused the blaze. And this could only have been done with the intention of burning the building down. You don't fill up a building with gas and then light a match with children inside. That's not the procedure for saving lives and settling the matter peaceably. Now, before you go off on what I just said, the intention of killing all of these people, sit down and swallow this. Do your research. FLIR tapes. FLIR, F-L-I-R, forward-looking infrared. Forward-looking infrared FLIR tapes show young children trying to run out of the burning building. The FLIR tapes show bullets raining in on the kids, forcing them back into the building, where, of course, they perished. Do your research properly before you start going off on me for, for what I just said. Get the facts. Again, innocent children, domestic terrorists, which during the attack, a fire engulfed Mount Carmel Center, and in total, 76 people died. Wow. Regardless of what you may think about David Koresh or what he did or didn't do, you tell me, who is the real domestic terrorist here? Now we're told that these events Ruby Ridge and Waco 
quote the course instigated by the feds. We are told that these were the motivation for Timothy McVeigh to blow up the Oklahoma City Federal Murrah Building. And again, this happened on April 19th. Coincidentally, you decide. McVeigh and his accomplice were then tried and convicted. Just another story of right-wing extremists and homegrown terrorism. Got it? That's the story. End of story, right? Nice, clean deal. Terrible, bad news. We got our guy. He's in prison. It's over. Let's move on. However, if you do your research and check history, it's very interesting to note that prior to this event in Oklahoma City, an anti-terrorism bill, which I call an anti-Bill of Rights bill, designed solely just to take away the rights and privacy of American citizens, this anti-terrorism bill had been languishing in Bill Clinton's Congress and going nowhere. Someone wanted to push it through. It wasn't going through. Guess what happened to this dead bill after Oklahoma City event? It just happened to sail right on through Congress with hardly any debate. It's amazing how things like that work, isn't it? Sometimes politics can be so smooth. And of course, the rights of we the people were further encroached upon eating away at our rights and privacy. Was that a coincidence? What do you think? All right, so this was officially a done deal. Not quite so fast. Back in these days, I was doing a radio show on uh, the American Patriot Radio Network, 1360 AM in Johnstown, Colorado. And it was also simulcast uh, worldwide on WWCR shortwave radio. WWCR is Worldwide Christian Radio, shortwave. Now, General Partin was a career munitions expert. He did a complete technical analysis on the damage caused to the building and what actually caused it to come down, using a lifetime career of experience and knowledge to draw upon. For brevity, I won't go into all the details. You can look that up yourself. They're readily available. You can find them here on this website, physics911.net. But here is his conclusion in part, just to get right to the chase. Quote, the Murrah Federal Building was not destroyed by one sole truck bomb. The major factor in its destruction appears to have been detonation of explosives, carefully placed at four critical junctures on supporting columns within the building. End quote. And the conclusion goes on into some more detail. But that's the salient point right there. The building was not destroyed by one sole truck bomb. There was clear evidence of multiple detonations going off. Now, the IRS and the FBI had offices in the building. No surprise, right? It's a federal building. When you do your complete research on this, you'll find that employees of the IRS and the FBI were told not to come into work that day for no apparent reason. Coincidence? You'll also find that there was a daycare center in the building. And I spoke with the mother of one of the dead children. She was asking one simple question. Why were we not also told to stay home this day? Could it be that the people behind this constructed event wanted the world to see pictures like these so they could blame fringe white extremists and domestic terrorists like him? And you still see today the demonization and vilification of so-called white Christian extremists who are guilty of homegrown domestic terrorism 
And this agenda is being pushed and pushed and pushed to indoctrinate the public. Hopefully, they haven't indoctrinated you yet. So the next time you hear this kind of language about white extremists who are labeled as domestic terrorists, remember Gordon Call, a poor farmer who just wanted to be left alone. And for that, he was tortured, hacked to pieces, alive, shot, and then burned. And of course, when you hear people talk about these vile, toxic, dangerous, white extremists, militia leaders, these people who are armed and dangerous, come back here to this video. Look deep into the eyes of Vicki Weaver, who was in her mountain home, trying to take care of her family, live a peaceful life, holding her baby when she took a federal bullet to the head. Again, ask yourself, just who exactly are the domestic terrorists? Now, with all this going on in the 80s and the early 90s, we come to the Montana Freeman. Let's find out how vile and toxic and dangerous these armed militia leaders were. You're going to find out the truth. You're going to find out who were these people who held the feds and the FBI and their armed military at bay in the Montana Plains for 81 days. Here's my conversation with Dan Peterson, one of the militia ringleaders of the Montana Freeman, done just here in June 2017. Listen in. Okay, so just kind of going from my memory and understanding, uh, uh, maybe we could start off with uh, item number one, just kind of how the, the so-called Montana Freeman group formed. He started up there in Roundup, right? Or at least Leroy did with, uh, yeah, you were there with Leroy well, in Roundup. Yeah, but uh, him and Rod Skirdall were together to begin with. Uh -huh. and, and then see uh, what they did then, uh, they charged a whole bunch of us with criminal syndicalism. Yeah. It's a code in the Montana code. It's uh, It was formed during uh, the Butte, Montana era with the, with the miners, and it was uh, to stop uh, monopolies and, and the overthrow of the government. We wasn't doing anything like trying to overthrow the government. It was already overthrown. We were just trying to get from the democracy back to the republic. Uh, but there was, uh, this happened through the lawyer cartel, the American Bar Association, and Nicky Murnion, he was the chief orchestrator of that. He was the county attorney out of Garfield County, and, and another guy by the name of Bill Berger, he was the county attorney for Petroleum County, where I'm from, and, and uh, they were getting quite concerned because of the fact that what we were exposing uh, with the corrupt government, and we didn't even know, but at the time, those guys were heavily involved in with Bill Clinton and the Bush boys bringing drugs into Montana. Uh. And so there was a guy by the name of Tommy R. Kennedy. He was out of uh, Illinois. He had been sent out here to investigate uh, like 400 unsolved mysteries, or mi unsolved murders, on Indian reservations, and, and it was all due to the drug cartel that was bringing the drugs in, and then they was distributing off of seven reservations here. And so they were we using, really didn't... They were using but, the uh, reservations as kind of a safe haven? Right, uh, you know, because it's under their jurisdiction. Yeah, no federal police yeah. or county sheriffs. Right. County sheriffs can't really go in, but then the thing of it is, though, the, the county sheriffs and, and uh, the county attorneys was in on a lot of this stuff. Nicky Mernon was one of them, and it's either true or it's false, but uh, uh, his own family had him run out of Garfield County after they got rid of us because of all of his corrupt 
activities, and, and a lot of it was uh, distributing drugs to the high school kids. And so that, that became pretty well known, and they just ran him out of town, huh? His own family, yeah. They told him, they gave him 24 hours to pack up and leave, oh, and he was wow. a county attorney. Wow. Now, that's really something when your own family has to tell you to clean up your act and get or get out of Dodge. Yeah, that's serious. You know, that's it's serious. it's a sad situation, but he he's one of those arrogant uh, uh, attorneys that puts himself above the law, and, and he thinks that he can manipulate everybody, including his own family, and his own family got sick and tired of it. Okay, it's, so uh, Nick Mernian, he was he was run out. What, what was he, the county prosecutor, and, and he was the one that spearheaded this criminal syndicalism charge right. against you? Okay. Yeah. And so what happened to and that then, charge when he got run out of town? Did that just kind of go away, or what? Well, yeah, they arrested a bunch of us and whatnot like that, and but uh, some of us, well, I went on the lamb. I was at Rod Skirdall's, and and uh, they arrested him and and uh, Clay and Karen, Karen Taylor. They were in Garfield County, and well, let me see, Bob and Ann Cramlick. They were in Fergus County. There was a, quite a bunch of them that they they had arrested, but see. The reason they were really mad at us, Mark, was the fact that or wanted to come after us is we used the Uniform Foreign Notorial Act, which um, the Montana's legislature has adopted. And if you study the Montana Code, and pretty near every state in the Union has adopted the Uniform Foreign Notorial Act because there's notaries and then there's notary publics. We're all aware of notary publics, but very seldom do we ever speak about just a notary other than uh, when we do speak notary, everybody thinks we're speaking of a notary public. But they have a notary works on the private side, and a notary public does everything through the public. And... Uh, that's what we had done, and so then we ran for, a uh, bunch of us ran for justice of the peace of the county, because a justice of the peace and a notary are synonymous. I was elected into my county, but they wouldn't let me take the office, and the reason was is because I had kind of campaigned on that if, if I got elected that I was going to get rid of the county commissioners and the corrupt sheriff. Wow. And that scared the Jesus out of him. <laughs> and, uh, Rod Skirdall, he got elected for Muscleshell County, and who it was for Fergus County, but in Garfield County, it was Clay Taylor. And see, they take and, and uh, they say that there's in uh, in a republic, there's supposed to be one JP for every precinct, every voting precinct. And like in my town, here in my county, there's three precincts, but there's only one notary. So there's two offices that are left vacant. And, uh, but see, it was all changed during the time of the declared bankruptcy in 1933. And that's when they really changed this from a, from a republic to the democracy. And, but it started in Lincoln's era, and it just progressively got worse. And then as you listen to the campaigns of uh, Hillary Clinton and everybody, they kept talking about the progressive democracy. Well, that's what it is. It's Progressively, it's just a select few uh, start in uh, a communist or uh, a commune, I, I guess you call it, when you look up the word democracy and republic, there's quite a difference. And uh, that's what we were trying to do is get back to the republic side of, of the United States of America. They, they didn't like that. You know, all we wanted was truth and justice. And according to the scripture, it says that, that it's our duty and our obligation. It also says that in the Declaration of Independence that we celebrate every July 4th. But uh, whenever you start doing it, boy, they're gonna, they put the hammer down on you. They, just, they don't want you uh, playing in their sandbox. 
Yeah, they're progressively moving away from the du jour government, so that would be an accurate uh, term to use, progressives. Oh, yeah. oh yes. Uh, but now there's uh, there's been quite a movement here since uh, about 2010, a movement to go back to the republic for the United States of America. See, they, they, they use the word for, but they also use the word United States of America. Yeah. And there's a difference between the word for and of. And it changes the whole outlook and the whole meanings of everything. And, you know, that's what they've done. Now we found out that it's called dog Latin. They take and, and give us all kinds of different definitions and whatnot. And as, so what we've learned in school years ago, heck, I'm 75 years old, uh, what we learned years ago, it has no meaning anymore, and, and uh, they've taken prayer out of schools and can't even pledge to the flag. And, and as I recall, when I pledged to the flag, it said to the republic for which it stands. It doesn't say for the democracy which it stands. And whenever you take and bring that up to the judges and attorneys and whatnot like that, they say, well, that's been changed. Well, if it's been changed, then why isn't it in print and everybody notified about it? Right, right. Official notification but, and records, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, getting back to your criminal syndicalism, uh, that all came about as you established the Justice Township, is that right? Well, that was basically it, because... Uh, it says in Article 2, Section 2 of the Montana Constitution, it says that, this is verbatim, it says uh, the people have the exclusive right to govern themselves as a free, independent, sovereign state, period. Then it says they may alter or abolish that form of government whenever they deem it necessary. Now, if you'll recall what it says in the Declaration of Independence, it says whenever a government whenever a government gets out of control, it's a duty and obligation of the people to change that form of government. Yeah. Now, is that true or is that false? It's still in the uh, 1972 Montana Constitution, and I abused that. I went and testified for Richard Joseph Finley down in Sacramento, and he had been charged because he had used one of Leroy's bogus instruments and had it on deposit with uh, the Bank of America and was being paid interest, but yet they kept saying that they were bogus instruments. They had no value. Well, if they had no value, then why was the Bank of America taking and, and paying interest? And But I used that, what I just quoted out of the Montana Constitution. I memorized that year, years ago, and I still stand on it today. Whenever these goons start talking to me, I just tell them, well, here's what it says in the Montana Constitution. Is it true or is it false? I'm not going to go by some hotshot attorney or judge or because a good majority of them, they always say, well, where did you come up with that? Well, I got it out of a copyrighted book. Was it copyrighted or was it copied wrong? <laughs> you know, uh, right. Yeah, well, that uh, same 1972 Montana Constitution, that was also the yeah. one that you guys discovered that they had written out the boundaries, wasn't it? Right, yeah. You had discovered? Yep, yeah, there. tell us about that. Well, it says that there will be a description of what the state boundaries are. We assume when we cross the state line at North Dakota that it says uh, entering the state of Montana. Uh, but it isn't written in the Constitution. But it, it was. Doesn't tell, it doesn't tell where the boundaries are between Canada and Montana or Canada, or I mean Montana and Idaho, Montana and Wyoming, yeah. or Montana and North and South Dakota. It doesn't say that. If you don't have boundaries, so, you don't have a state. That's right. But see, when you get to studying what really went on, too, Mark. Uh, okay, folks, let me interrupt here, and I'm going to interject something just to show you what we're talking about on these boundaries. Right now we're looking at the 
original 1889 Constitution for the state of Montana. Take a look at, uh, we've got the preamble, and we go down starting right off with Article 1. What do you see there? Boundaries. The boundaries of the state of Montana shall be as follows to wit, beginning at a point formed by the intersection of the 27th degree of longitude west from Washington, and they go on to define those boundaries. Okay, Article 1, Section 1, right at the very beginning. It's clear what the state of Montana is, at least in terms of its geographical boundaries. It's very specifically defined. Therefore, it exists as that thing which has been defined. Now, let's take a look at the modern Constitution, which has been updated in 1972, and look at Article 1. What do we have for boundaries in Article 1 in the updated Constitution? All it talks about is basically ceding all Indian lands to Congress and the federal government. There are no boundaries. How do you have a state if you cannot define it, if it doesn't have a definition in terms of geographical boundaries? It's a fiction. It's a fiction as a figment in the imagination of the people that are making reference to it. It doesn't exist. It's a fiction. Now, think about this. Think about all the talk you hear in the news. Europe, no borders. Free immigration. The southern border of the United States with Obama, open border. No border. Who needs borders? Everything's open. This is freedom. They sell it to us as freedom. When in fact, if you do not have borders, you do not have a body politic with which to govern, which means there is no governance, there is no self-governance, there is no sovereignty. What we have is a vacuum, and so what do we have to fill that vacuum? Ah, don't worry, we have Agenda 21, which is now Agenda 30. The UN will save the day. Don't worry, they got it all figured out. You see what's happening here. This is a clear illustration of what we're talking about. Now, back to the conversation. But see, when you get to studying what really went on too, Mark, uh, in 1889 was when this state was supposedly formed out of Northwest Territory. And that's an impossibility because in 18... Wasn't it 18... Uh, 71, that uh, the corporation of uh, the District of Columbia was formed, and that's when uh, we started into the democracy. Yeah, the that was right Act. after the Civil War. And uh, the thing of it was, is now uh, everything uh, west of the Ohio River is still a territory, it is not a state. You, you can check all of this because there's no boundary lines. Uh, we've argued the issue, and, and uh, it says that it has to be written in the Constitution. It has to give a description. It isn't there. Who's right and who's wrong? We have a legitimate argument, but you can't take it in front of anybody because uh, they say, well, where, where did you get your qualifications? Well, I got it out of the public fool system that was orchestrated by the Educational Department of the United States of America. And mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the Republic side, I'm talking about the democracy side. Yeah, the attorneys. Yeah. And then, you know, it just goes on and on and on. The more you chew on it, the bigger it gets. And uh, it's really frustrating uh, that they can they can do this and they can stop you from running 
running for office. They didn't want us to be justice of the peace because the justice of the peace in my county, Petroleum County, the only elected officials are the county commissioners and the justice of the peace. It's a commissioner form of government. There's only two of them in the whole United States, and Petroleum County happens to be one of them. The county commissioners, they appoint a county manager. The county manager also wears the hat of a sheriff. He's also superintendent of schools for the county. Oh, they got any number of things. And see, this was one of the things that we was bringing out because how I got involved with this is the little sheriff, I'd known him ever since he was a little kid, and he was he was no good when he was a kid. He still isn't, but <laughs> that never changed, right? it's, not for, it's not for me to judge anyway. But I, I, I got damn disgusted with him because of the fact that that he wouldn't listen. And uh, I, I done it to myself. Uh, one night we was at a bar, and he was sitting down at one end of the bar, and I was at the other end, and he didn't know that I was in there, but he was bad-mouthing me. So I got up and walked down to him and looked him straight in the face, and I said, you know, I said, I think your mom and dad screwed up when you was born. And he got the funniest look on his face, and he says, what do you mean? And I said, I think they put the clothes on the afterbirth and threw the child out with the water. <laughs> and... You know, I probably shouldn't have said it because I said it in a, in a community setting and everybody just roared because nobody really cared for him. But, uh, you know, sometimes a guy speaks when he shouldn't, and, and I'm, I'm like that. I, you know, if I feel something isn't right, there's something on the inside of me tells me to speak up. I don't let anybody run over the top of me. No. I never have, never will. No, more people should be like that. I think well, so. Well, it's sometimes it's detrimental. Sometimes you know that's yeah. what got me another ninety months is when the FBI came and investigated me, and just before I was to come home in two thousand and nine, and they wanted to know what I was going to do. I think I already told you this, and I told them I was going to go home and run for sheriff, and they told me that I couldn't. And I said, "Why not?" And they said, "Because you're a convicted felon. You can't be around guns." I don't have to have guns to be a sheriff, do I? Yeah. And that's what I told him. I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, I don't have to be around guns. A piece of paper and a pencil works just fine for me. And that was the wrong thing to say. Oh, boy, yeah. It, and uh, so they charged me with uh, writing false claims against two judges in Texas and, and the one out in Washington state that came out and, and prostituted us. And, uh, yeah, probably should have just told them you're going to be a librarian or, uh, something like that. <laughs> well, see, it, it, it wouldn't have made too much difference because, uh, they were, <laughs> you know, I had been teaching this while I was in prison. We had got permission from, the warden and, and uh, the ACE coordinator, that's adult continued education is what ACE stands for. And they had came to me, well, they came to a friend of mine out of Austin, Texas. And uh, anyway, then then he came to me and said, hey, they, they want us to start, or want, he said, they want me to start teaching something about how to read law books. And he asked me if I'd help. And I said, you Damn right I will. Well, anyway, I'd done that for about six months, and man, I'll tell you what, that's uh, that really upset them. They finally had a judge out of uh, St. Louis, Missouri, that had a big meeting at the prison and uh, told the warden that he had to stop that you and the law class because they were getting too many wins. And it was quite simple, it was because all of the laws that these people were being thrown in prison for, drug laws and whatnot, has never been enacted as a positive law. And in fact, Title 28 and, 20 and Title 18 of the United States Codes has never been enacted because it's supposed to be done when Congress is in session, and that was June 25th of 1948. And if you look up the 
in the congressional record, uh, uh, Congress had adjourned. And uh, there, so, it, and it clearly states that the laws have to be enacted while Congress is in session. Well, you'd think so. Yeah. Common sense. Well, it isn't just me with that opinion. It's It's been litigated numerous times by different people. And they were the ones that really brought it to my attention. So I, I, whenever I find something like that, then I start digging into it myself to find out if these people really know what they're talking about. And sure enough, they did. And uh, yeah. it's just like the criminal syndicalism. Uh, it had been, uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court and, and declared unconstitutional in 1925. Now, here it is in 19. Uh, it was about 1993 or 94 when they took and and used this law that had already been uh, declared unconstitutional. Criminal syndicalism is is you know it went all the way to the Supreme Court, but the federal Supreme Court. Yeah. But yet these we have these high powered attorneys like Nikki Mernin, you know, they just keep push, 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 pushing and. And uh, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, they've got that that American Bar Association behind them that is the biggest monopoly that there is. And when you read Title 15 of the United States Code, it says mon monopolies are unlawful. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. Nothing. They don't follow anything. No, laws. they don't follow anything. The law is only to be used to uh, enhance business. And if it goes against them, they ignore it. Well, the thing of it is, when you really get down to it, uh, uh, they're impeding commerce, but if this is all on commerce and everything is in bankruptcy, and and uh, the bankruptcy laws supersede anything else, that's why the IRS is so successful in what they do. They get they got a 99.9 .9 conviction rate, you know. Yeah. Uh, the thing of it is, well, it's like my own family. They they thought I was a tax protester, and I kept telling them. Even when my mother was alive, I I said, I don't know what you're talking about. God, I smoke. I pay taxes on uh, tobacco. I said I drink. Pay tobacco on, or taxes. taxes on alcohol. I buy gasoline, pay taxes, buy groceries, pay taxes. I said, what the hell are you talking about? And they said, we don't file IRS. And I said, I don't have to. Not required to. Yeah. They said everybody else is. I said, yeah, but I'm not everybody else. That's their problem. <laughs> yeah, that's your problem. Yeah. My son, I just, in fact, I just ran across his letter he sent to me when I was in Marion, Illinois, in, in, the, in the terrorist unit. Anyway, uh, he said, Dad, I'd like to have you back in the family. But he said, this Freeman shit, he said, I just can't put up with it. Well... <laughs> Uh, that's fine, you know. I I don't call it Freeman shit. It, it, to me, you're either a Freeman or you're a slave, and everybody has been a slave, and I, and I don't like being a slave to anybody, and I don't want anybody to be, be a slave to me. I just want peace and justice, and what I work for, I want to be able to own and control. Sure, have but, a system uh, of laws that can protect you and you can live uh, within. That's... That's all anybody can ask for. Let's uh, let's go well, back. To, let's go back to the Justice Township. I want to hit on that a little bit. How did that all come about? You know, we talked about the boundaries not being there for the state of Montana, and uh, uh, what was the basis for creating Justice Township? Well, uh, the right of self-government is common law. Okay. And okay, in the Montana. Constitution in the 1889 Constitution and in the 1972 Constitution, it says the townships can be formed. Well, Montana is one of the towns or one of the states that never ever developed any townships. Yeah, but it's in the book how to do it. Granted, there is no state of Montana, but the right of self government, it's our duty and our obligation to start. Now, when you start building a house, do you put up the chimney first or do you put in the basement and then the chimney? Yeah. So we started with the basement, and the basis is a township. And, uh, you know, when, when you study the way the townships are, are 
run like in Nebraska and in other places like that, there's so many townships. And then there's township uh, people, then they answer to the county commissioners. And uh, so there's another tier of government underneath the county commissioners. Okay. And the county commissioners right now in Montana, they have all three branches of government in their hip pocket, and they don't even know it. They have uh, the legislative, executive, and judicial branch of government, and it's quite simple because they can make ordinances, rules, and regulations for the county. Is that true or is that not true? No. Okay, so that that would be the legislative part. The executive branch, they can they can enforce that, but they also pay the bills. They they uh, guide the county clerk and recorder and the county treasurer and everything like that, you know, and they're kind of the overseer, but they can also enforce it, the law, through the sheriff. And uh, I had a cousin that was uh, head of all of the, he worked in his way up through the county commissioner chain, and he was over all of the county commissioners in Montana at one time. Him and I graduated in high school together, and and ran around together. You know, I thought he was going to make a hell of a good commissioner, but about six months after he got in, you could not even talk to him. No? He was so much, he had put himself up on a pedestal. I don't know who got to him. It really don't make, well, never mind. You know, I feel sorry for him and I pray for him because one day he's going to have to meet the creator and he's the one that makes the final judgment. Not me, not you, not anybody else. But whenever you start screwing over all your fellow man, you, we're in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah no doubt. So well, was there was there a, so the township was set up, and the townships are prescribed by law to be a certain area, are they? Or did you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you you have uh, all all of the United States has supposedly been surveyed by registered surveyors, right? And they have townships, and they have uh, uh, they have uh, well, we have acres, and then we have uh, uh, the breakdown of, of all of the land. Uh -huh. uh, there are so many sections in a township, and in uh, what is there, thirty six sections in the township, and stuff like that. And a township is uh, supposed to be ten by ten. So we was going to start from the from the bottom and, and go up. Well, they didn't like that because of the fact that we were right and they were wrong. Because they kept saying, where are you getting this stuff? Right out of your copyrighted book. <laughs> is it copied wrong or is it copied right? Yeah. And see, that's still one of my answers to them. And, and that really upsets them because, you know... They're either right or I'm right. Yeah. So now we have a dispute. We have, we have a debatable issue. They don't want to debate on it. They just want to go along the way the world's been turning. You know, I'm not trying to stop the world. I just would like to get it back to honesty a little bit, just like Christ Jesus did. Yeah, that's what he was working for. But... Uh, we yeah. got all of these mightier than thou's, and they, they, they join that profession called the American Bar Association, which is the bar's accreditation uh, registry. Registry out of out of Great Britain, you know, and we keep thinking, you know, I was told that the Revolutionary War, where we gained our independence from Great Britain, but then when you get to checking into it, we haven't we haven't gained nothing. We're no. still under them. And Leroy Schweitzer, he was a real good Catholic. At one time, he was an altar boy, and, and he came out of a Catholic family. I had two sisters who were nuns and whatnot. And, and he told me, he said, Dan, he said, I think when we get to the bottom of all of this, we're going to find out it's coming right out of the Vatican. And, you know, Mark, he was right. Yeah. Yeah, we've learned it's so much terrible. since then. I said since that time, uh, when he said that, uh, so much new information has come out on that subject. Definitely. Yeah. But, it, you know, and that, that's one of the reasons why he's not alive today. Yeah. 
you know, they, they put him down underground there in Florence, Colorado. My God, put a man 60 feet underground and you know, your only communication is through a computer, a TV screen. You know, isn't that a little bit of uh, what they call cruel and unusual punishment? He never robbed anybody. He never killed anybody. He, he, well, he was just a knowledgeable man, and they didn't want that. They, they wanted him out of the way, and they got him out of the way. Knowledge is more threatening than munitions. That's, that's why Russ yeah. is sitting there with, a, what, like a 43-year sentence. I think he, yep. had, he had like 20 years originally. And then, uh, yep. and then he filed some papers, and they took that as a threat, and they added 20 more years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they'll just keep doing it because uh, Rush Landers, is, he's knowledgeable, and he knows what he's talking about. He's right. And, uh, you know, I don't know what we can do to get him out of there. I would like to be able to help him, but I, I don't know. Now it's... They've even got the threats over my head that if I associate with any known felons that, that they can put me back in prison. Well, you know, where in the hell is that in the Bible? I haven't seen it yet, and nature's law to me supersedes everything there is, doesn't it, or does it not? Yeah. And so, so once you're free, you don't have freedom of speech, you don't have freedom of association, Hell, you don't even have you don't even have freedom of religion uh, if it goes against the uh, politicals. That's right. They're they're saying anybody that believes in God now, they're uh, they're a terrorist. Well, I guess I'm a terrorist. Yeah. Well, that's why they had me in the terrorist union the unit in the Marion, Illinois. Darn right. Darn right. So. Well, yeah. Back to Justice Township. So what did you do to uh, put the world on notice that this was created and it exists now? I guess uh, I guess there was a group of commissioners that was formed and, and took office and made a public notice, or how did that happen? Well, yeah, we, that's what we did. We held an election, and, and we appointed uh, everybody as, as uh, justices of the peace from the common law side, because everybody is a justice, and we all want peace, don't we? Sure. But anyway, uh, and then I was elected as a treasurer, and uh, Leroy Schweitzer was a chief justice. And, uh, you know, it's really amazing that uh, James Burns from out in, in Oregon, he came out here to get this thing all started, and he recognized... Uh, Leroy as the Chief Justice for Justice Township. He, I heard him say it with my own ears in different uh, meetings that we had had. Oh, yeah, the, you know, the federal, had, you're referring to the, the federal Judge Burns in, in your trial. Right. Yeah. And so, so then, see, what he did then, he, he got on the phone and he called Nick Murnion and he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Murnion, but he says, I don't think this case meets muster. He says, I think it should be dismissed. They got rid of him immediately, and that's when they brought in John C. Kuhnauer out of the Western District of Washington State. Yeah, we can't honor the law. We have to have someone uh, in the bag. And that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Uh, See, we've got a we've got an affidavit from a guy by the name of James Coates, who was the jury foreman, and he said the Montana Freeman would have never got a free trial, can never get a free trial in this setting because there's outside influences. And uh, one of them was this woman; uh, her one of her relatives was a sheriff, and the sheriff had said, "Get off that case! Don't listen to it." Because if you do, and they are convicted, the Montana Freeman will come after you. <laughs> yeah, with notices of law and uh, trespass. <laughs> yeah. But see, it's my understanding that a jury, is, uh, a juror, is not supposed to be influenced by anybody. They're supposed to know the law and know it well. And uh, how many people know that? You know, they just go in there and they're a puppet for the prosecuting attorney and for the for the judge. 
and it's a sad situation. I, you know, I don't know how we're going to uh, get it taken care of. I keep saying that I don't think we can. I think we we've just got to work forward to having the second coming come because man has got it so screwed up now. The only one that can do it is somebody with supernatural powers. Or if there's enough of a miracle to enlighten the people of a particular county where they could then take control, but uh, that's that's as much of a miracle as the second coming, pretty much. Right. Well, there is a great awakening going on. I uh, was told that in Washington, D.C. here some months ago that there was like 50 tri or 500 tribes of American natives from on the North American continent that went to Washington, D.C. and had a big powwow for the Great Awakening. And uh, a lot of people condemn the, uh, the American native. I don't. Uh, I feel that they've been crapped on, but uh, they're just like anybody else. Uh, there are some of them that take advantage of being crapped on, and they was given everything but there is some real good ones. I've met a lot of good ones. I've met a lot of bad ones, but the same way with whites, blacks, it doesn't make any difference what race and yeah. nationality they yeah, are. There's good, and there's good ones and there's bad ones. Okay, so back to the formation of Justice Township. I'm interested to, to develop you know, what happened there. And so, so this was created. How did you notice the public? Did you file a, a, a public notice in, in the paper or... And we done it in the paper, and we also sent it to the county commissioners in Garfield County, and then we registered it with uh, uh, Mark Roscoe. He was the governor at the time. Joe Mazurich, he was the uh, state attorney general. They were all notified, uh, and uh, they were given 10 days to rebut, or we felt that if they didn't rebut us in 10 days, they mm -hmm. would acquiesce to that we were right and, and uh, there could be nothing come down on us. However, we know that's what is supposed to happen, the way it's supposed to happen, but they don't follow that rule either. No. Did you get any kind of reaction at all? Well, we called the grand jury. Uh, uh, we wanted to have a grand jury meeting with them, and uh, we was at Rod Skirdall's in the Bull Mountains here north of uh, or south of Roundup, when all of this, when we was getting all of this put together, and they circled circled in a in a helicopter uh, when it was scheduled, they were supposed to be there, and then they gave the big excuse that there was no. What was the excuse? You cut out there for a minute. They said that there there was no place for the helicopter to land. Oh, <laughs> was that the house in Roundup? Yeah. Well, it was in the Bull Mountains, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I think that's where I was, the first trip that I made. Nice little place. Yeah. In fact, the lady that owns it now, she's got a video on YouTube saying, hey, this is where the Montana Freemen were, kind of like a historical landmark. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, they think they own that. They don't own anything. Oh. Because uh, there was a claim put on that. It was put into the ROS Trust. And everybody assumes that that's uh, Rodney Owens Girdall, but it's a resurrection of our Savior Trust. And there was a claim put against that property. There's 20 acres. And, but again, uh, you know, they jump, they don't even go check, uh, do a title search or claim search, see if there's any uh, encumbrance on the property. They don't do any of that anymore. And if they do, then they always find a judge that, says, well, that's all null and boy, it's bogus, and, and on and on and on. So okay. uh, basically we have no law, and they talk about Putin over in Russia, the way he treats his people. Uh, it sounds to me like they, they got a better life than we do. At least they know where they stand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've often thought about that myself, you know. If, uh, and I think if war broke out between Russia and the United States, I'd go to Russia. <laughs> Well, that's, you know, that's the way I feel now, too, because I, as I was growing up, you know, everybody was always talking about the communists, the communists, the communists. My God, we were living in a communist state. What are they talking about? Yeah, propaganda. 
Yeah. Well, getting the troops to rally behind him. Okay, so you invited everybody for a meeting. They didn't show up. Uh, what were some of the notable events that, that proceeded from there? You guys made some judgments. I know, I, I know at some point that the local authorities, uh, word has it that they were afraid to come on to Justice Township. I guess well, we had we we put out a bounty for their arrest. Okay. And we posted it all over the county. Based on what? That was after we had moved from Skirdall's place up to Justice Township. Okay. And uh, it just scared the bejesus out of them, you know. And uh, Bill Stanton again, he opened his mouth. He was he was one that was being foreclosed on and, and uh, Nick Mernion called him. The county attorney called him and the, because it was uh, one of the signatures on the on the bounty was Bill Stanton and and uh, Mernian asked him. He says, "Well, what you going to do with me?" And he said, "I'm going to hang your dumb ass. I'm going to push you off the bridge with a rope oh, around your neck." Oh boy! You know, and you don't you don't say stuff no, like that. No, but no, no, no. But the thing of it is, it, it was sad. There, there, he, he, and whether we didn't like him or whatnot, you you just don't talk about people and you don't make a threat like that. No, no, it's... but. But, you know, it's just like everything. Uh, there's always seems to be a Judas or a the in among, you know, they claim that they know, but then they don't know. And then they, they speak when they shouldn't speak. And they, he wasn't speaking for all of us. He was speaking for himself is what it was. Emotionally. Yeah. But, but see, they take that out of context. And, and so then what he says, we all say. Yeah. Yeah. And that isn't true. Well, what were the charges, the arrest warrants, based on initially? What was, why were those issued? Well, we're criminal syndicalism. No. When or we, you, when, you, when, you mean on the public officials? Yeah, yeah, the bounty you put out. Well, the, just obstruction of justice and, and sedition against uh, the people. And I don't remember. I don't even have, you know, I, there used to be a copy of it around someplace that again that was some of our evidence that was on the rider truck that was turned over to Carl Owes who was a state legislature and he was supposed to protect all of our evidence so that we could go into court with it and as soon as it crossed that imaginary line at Justice Township the FBI confiscated it and said it's contraband. Now how in the hell can uh, evidence be contraband? That's my question. Yeah. Yeah, well, they stole my yeah. exculpatory evidence in my trial as well. So, That's Well, they do it all the time because of the fact that they can't win. Yeah. But they're not, they're not going to let you win either. No. We I'll, know that. Do they ain't going to let anybody win. And this is why I'm saying, you know, that uh, we've got to be awfully careful what we do and who we associate with. It's devastating. We know that there's a problem, but... They're probably listening to this conversation right now, and I hope they are, because I hope that they're getting an education, because this thing is going to come crashing down, and I pray every day that Donald Trump will get it handled, because he's our only salvation until the, the Creator comes back, as far as I'm concerned. But America is done. As you said, there is a great awakening in process, and... The day of judgment is coming, and there might yes. be several days of judgment before the main day of judgment comes, and uh, that's what I would be afraid of if I was one of the criminals being uh, given a public paycheck. But well, see, the thing of it is, they're non-productive workers. They don't produce anything except strife. Yeah, and uh, uh, they come in and they want to keep everything all stirred up. So that they can, uh, that gives them justification for their job. Sure. You know, it's just like driving down the road and you don't have a driver's license. All right. What is a driver's license? Let's take that issue. You know, I'm not, I'm not in commerce. I'm just, I'm in my private vehicle. But then when people start finding out that one tenth of that vehicle belongs to the corporation, and they don't have full ownership, uh, 
it just shocks the Jesus out a lot of people when you start bringing that to their attention. Yeah. Just like the the marriage license in Montana, it says that all off or it says all uh, produce from this union becomes wards of the state. What are they talking about? They're talking about your children. Yeah. And you said that's on the so back, we've got the it. back of the marriage certificate. So anybody that has a marriage certificate from Montana or check for other states. I don't imagine it's on all states, but it could be. Well, it is on in all states. Every state that we've checked anyway. Yeah. And uh, see, what made me aware of that was Roy Swassinger, the three-star general out of Fort Collins, Colorado, that was promoting the, the farms claims, right. which became the Nocera. And it still hasn't been enacted, but uh, the Navy SEALs and, and Delta Force went in and, and forced Bill Clinton in to sign it into law. It had already been through Congress and been through the Supreme Court. And then after they did that, well, then they put a gag order on it and uh, told all congressmen and everybody, anybody that spills the beans, uh, they're, they're going to be held for treason. And, and that's one of the reasons why Paul... Uh, I don't know what the heck he, Paul Sandstone, I think, out of Minnesota. The, him and his wife and, and two daughters died in a plane crash because he was going to spill the beans. And, uh, no, I didn't write that history either, but it's well known. It's all over the Internet about the National Economic Stabilization and Recovery Act, but it's yeah. the National Economic Security and Recovery Act. They changed the icons. They they change one word in there, and then when you look it up, it says it's never been, never been uh, in Congress and all kinds of crap. Well, either either somebody's lying or it's true. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I got involved in that back, well, back in the early 1990s, and and I'm still waiting. That was supposed to have been supposedly uh, was supposed to have been announced on September 11th of 2001 by Alan Greenspan, and look what happened. Yeah. Now everybody's saying that was uh, the Arabs or Sharia or whoever they are came over and stole these airplanes and run into it. And I might, you know, I, I've been a mechanic all my life, and I was sure wasted a lot of money on acetylene. I, heck, if I'd have known diesel fuel or air, airplane fuel, uh, fuel like that would melt metal, I could have bought a whole bunch of that a lot cheaper than acetylene. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's another story, another story. Oh, another yeah, year. but it, it all ties together, and that's the thing that's so sad about it, you know. Uh, we was just a precursor, but I know people that was uh, ahead of us. You can take, uh, like, uh, Howard Freeman out of Lusk, Wyoming. You know, I I talked to him personally uh, several times. Yeah, uh, I studied before. his material. And uh, the then there's Houston Spolins. And, oh, you, we can just go on and on and on. There's all kinds of people that were trying to wake up America. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. But, see, we didn't label ourselves as Montana Freeman. Uh, the Billings Gazette newspaper is the one they said they think they're Freeman. Well, <laughs> I, I looked up in Black's Law Dictionary and under lawful man it says somebody uh, somebody who is free. Well, okay. Uh, that, that made uh, me, if I'm lawful and a free man, then if I'm not lawful, I must be a slave, right? Yeah. Well, what is it? One or the other. <laughs> yeah, one or the other. Let's let's get this taken care of. Yeah. And then yeah. that's another story. This woman that took and wrote all this crap. Her name was Clara Johnson. She was a reporter for the Billings Gazette. And at one time, I worked for the Great Falls Tribune. I was a district circulation manager for them. Lived in Bozeman, and we went on a we were union and went on a strike. And I finally got sick and tired of them and went up and went to one of their union meetings and told them, I said, I was going to give them three days to get this mess taken care of. And if they didn't, I was going to cross the picket line. And she was in this meeting and there was a big steward from 
out of San Francisco Chronicle there and smoking a big cigar about a foot long and 50 cent in diameter. Anyway, uh, one of the guys stood up and said, Peterson, if you cross the picket line, I'm going to come and kick the shit out of you. And I stood up and I said, I don't think there's anybody in here big enough to kick the shit out of me. <laughs> and I crossed the picket line and three days later we went back to press. But she hated me. She worked for the Great Falls Tribune at that time. And uh, when I crossed the picket line, I was in my company car and drove across the sidewalk. And a sports writer by the name of Wayne Arts, he uh, started hollering, scab, and all kinds of crap at me. And so I just stepped out of the car with a parked across the sidewalk and said, come over here. We'll just talk this matter over. Yeah. <laughs> and, Right. All management was standing upstairs looking out the windows and they kept hollering at me because they knew my character at that time. It didn't make too much difference how big somebody was. Hell, I'd take them on. And uh, stupid okay. again, you know. So you got but, uh, so you guys now have uh, arrest warrants out for local county officials and uh, on up on up the ladder. And, yeah. And uh, I guess it was then out of out of that that uh, it was perceived that you were impersonating public officials and the charges of criminal syndicalism came out of that process? No, I don't know. Criminal syndicalism came out before. Oh, okay. But see, they just progressively, they just kept adding on and adding on and adding on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because they finally had to admit that criminal syndicalism was was not a law. It, you know, it had already been uh, repealed, yeah. but it was still in print. See, that's the thing. It had been repealed, but it's still in print. So that makes it valid. No. If it's repealed, it's supposed to be lined out. It's just like with Bill Clinton and his... Everybody keeps saying how he repealed the Glass-Steagall Act. Well, that's damn funny. I can go into... Title 12 banks and banking in the United States Code, and I can find uh, the Glass Steel Act. I think it's 12378. It's still in there. It ain't been repealed. You know, and uh, every every time that I've seen anything that says it's repealed, it says it's repealed. Yeah, yeah. You and, can look it up. It's clear. Print it out. Right. Okay, so they've got warrants out for you. You've got warrants out for them. Uh, at some point, I guess you decided to move from Roundup over to Jordan and, uh, tell us about that story. Were you involved in the caravan there? Oh yeah. Yeah. Leroy, yeah. Leroy told the story of, uh, you know, waving at the sheriff as he drove by. We did it in the middle of the night. They had all kinds of stories, how they had people in uh, schools that, that, uh, they were afraid that we were going to come and take over the towns. Uh, they said that in Jordan. We never even went through Jordan. We took a backcountry road. Okay. We drove through Roundup, and we drove through Winnet, Montana, my hometown. Okay. And uh, there was nobody out. Me and my wife, my deceased wife, were following the caravan, and I stayed like about two or three miles behind. And we had two-way radios, and uh, I was kind of the what you'd call the outrigger last man. And uh, there was, you know, they said they knew that we were moving. They didn't know it, or they'd have been there. God, they. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but see, they got to they got to say everything they can to make themselves look good. Yeah, it looks like they're in control. Yeah. Yeah. When in fact they're the ones uh, sit sitting in the corner with their knees shaking. It sounds like. Well, yeah, and then but they, you know, they kept saying how we were going to come and take over the schools, and <laughs> we were just moving from one place to the other. You know, <laughs> uh, if there was ever going to be any any uh, confrontation, or anything, it was going to have to be started by them. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Sure wasn't by us. We still have the right of freedom of travel, or we hoped we did. Yeah, yeah. But well, well, you know, there's so there's so many stories out there, Mark, that it just 
you know, it's sickening to to uh, read them and even even think about what they're saying. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's why it's good to talk to you and get this get the straight scoop. I'll uh, I'll never forget my first trip up to uh, Roundup. Uh, we weren't sure exactly where the place was. We we're pretty sure we we're on the right road, but not too sure which ranch house it was until we came upon the no trespassing sign, which was about as big and bold and direct as you might ever imagine. And uh, uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but definitely trespassers would definitely be uh, prosecuted. And we go, yep, this must be the place. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, it's just like when Allison Sessions, the newswoman from ABC in, or in New York that came out from Mike Wallace and brought a news crew from uh, someplace in New Mexico, Ann and or Amy and, and Howell Boyle was their name. Anyway, we caught them on the ranch, and uh, I walked up to them. I, I was a constable, and I had on my badge and had a three fifty seven Magnum with an 18-inch barrel on it. Whoa. And uh, I asked them what they were doing on the property, and they said they wanted to come and do an update on us and we said well numerous times you was told down and round up to stay away from us now get the hell off well anyway uh allison sessions then and boil then i took the, i took your camera and i took the sound equipment and i threw it in the back of the pickup and leroy was polite and says I suggest you get in your van and leave. Now we're going to give you an escort. But anyway, I said, what are you doing on private property? And they, I said, didn't you see the no trespass signs? And they said, yeah, but half of it was ripped off. And I says, yeah, where was the other half? What did it say? They knew that the no trespass was there. The night before, they had went to Charlie Phipps, who was the county sheriff in Garfield County, and he told him, he said, stay away from there. Leave them men alone. Why did they show up? Because they do like the, uh, these news people. They get a conviction through the news media. They, they get everybody down. You know, it's just like a pack of wolves. Yeah. You know, they... But... Uh, well, it's just like... Anyway, this, uh... and then, then Allison Sessions, and when she was subpoenaed to come and testify in the court here and her doctor wouldn't let her come because she was pregnant so they took an FBI agent woman and set her in the witness chair and had this woman read Allison Sessions uh, uh, testimony now oh boy. It, my understanding That's is when, when you're uh, Accused of a crime, you have a right to face your accuser. Is that true or not? Well, sure, and that's hearsay. She doesn't have first-hand knowledge of what she's reading. No, no, and it, to me, that's obstruction of justice. It's just like they had me in prison under three Social Security numbers. Uh, Pat Shannon was the one that, would, that notified me about the first one. They was using a guy by the name of John B. Peterson out of Little Falls, Minnesota, used his Social Security number on my judgment and committal order. Wow. Think, think of all the money they made extra on that one, and then they went later oh. used two more. Well, yeah. So then when they gave me the second case, then they changed the last number in my real Social Security number, so I demanded a copy of the judgment and committal order, and and it came back, and it was still using the one from the case here in Billings. Okay, so then I, I said to the case manager and the counselor, I said, uh, what the heck's going on here? And they said, well, it's quite obvious. You've been using somebody else's uh, Social Security number. I said, what the hell are you talking about? You've been using And they that. said, well, you're, you're registered under three different Social Security numbers. I said, and I'm using somebody else's Social Security number? Come on. But see, that's another that's another big story, and uh, 
so then when they had me in solitary confinement in Stillwater, Minnesota, in a state institution, they even assigned me a state number to hold me in that state institution. Uh, they had a contract with the feds in the in a state uh, penitentiary. And uh, they gave me the number and the associate warden, uh, uh, Mary Cow, I think it was Mary Cowan or something like that. Anyway, I kept putting my copyright on my signature and, and secured party slash creditor and all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, I was just looking at that letter uh, day before yesterday and I, it said, because she kept returning my mails, and they said that you can't use any of that, uh, any insignias, anything, but you cannot use Latin phrases. Where did our law come from? Yeah, I mean, it's used all the time. Okay, so now, uh, I hadn't really paid attention, but I had a friend here, and he looked at that and he said, my God, Dan, he said, you got golden evidence right here. And this is way after the fact, but it's still fraud and uh, statute of limitation on fraud, fraud is just like murder. There isn't any. Yeah. See, uh, I'm either right or I'm wrong, yeah. but that's been my understanding. Okay, so back to uh, Jordan. You moved from Roundup to Jordan, and uh, do you have any idea how many people came for the classes over a period of time? A rough estimation? I well, I really can't say, but we had uh, we would have two day classes. We'd have them on Saturdays and Sundays, and all the time that we were there, we were booked up, and we had seats for 25 people and a lot of times there was five and six others that were standing yeah and yeah. as you remember when we was at rods we could only we could only accommodate like about eight or ten people and uh -huh. that was another one of the reasons why we moved up to rosette was because richard clark had a home up there and it had a double garage so what we did we converted that into a classroom okay. and uh yeah, it worked well. We, we, we videotaped everything, and we even had FBI agents that had supposedly taken these bogus warrants of, of uh, Leroy's, and they brought us $5,000 in cash numerous times and pickup loads of groceries and a two-way radio system, and, and they furnished us all with 9 millimeter Glocks and all kinds of stuff. To me, that's entrapment, but... Uh, it'll eventually come out in the wars. Uh, yeah. I think that someday there will be justice for Justice Township. Yeah, and that's one reason we wanted to you know, shine a light on it and uh, spread the word as best as possible. Um, yeah, you educated a lot of people, shared a lot of good information, and uh, I was up there twice myself, and I know people were coming from around the country. One thing that I found fascinating was uh, Leroy put the call out across the country for people to go to rummage, rummage sales, uh, bookstores, used bookstores, looking for historical law books uh, and, and things like that. And it uh, sounds like that, that was able to uh, garner some, some very interesting information, huh? Do you remember that? Well, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, there was, there was all kinds of interesting things that showed up with that. But, see, the thing of it is, uh, when I was first put in prison, uh, I was put in the Memphis FCI, Memphis, Tennessee, and they had an old, old law library with all kinds of old books and whatnot in it. And as the years went on, they started destroying all of those books. No, no. Uh, in every institution that I was at, they, they, they had a bunch of those old books, but then they started putting everything on computer. And it's hard for people like me. I, I like new technology and whatnot, but these computers to me, uh, they're just like a man told me probably in about 1970 or so. He said, he said, I think the, computer is another mark of the beast and it's going to be the downfall of the American nation. And I think he was right on track because you know, look at our little children now 
they all have these smartphones and iPads and all of this kind of stuff, and you can't even talk to them because they're busy on them things, and they have no home life. Uh, uh, it's, it's sickening. Yeah, but, when's the last time they actually sat down and read a book? So, folks, that concludes part one of this series, and uh, I hope you found it as interesting as I have. Part two, we're going to get into uh, more of the substance of what was actually being taught in the classes, and you'll hear more about the actual standoff and how that all came about. you got some of the lead-up to that in this session, but we'll get more in-depth with that and other pertinent issues that pertain more to the news. you got a lot of background and got to know Dan quite a bit in this session, and uh, next time around, we're going to get right down to the... Uh, the exciting standoff part and uh, what was going on with all of that. I will leave you with a reminder that uh, in my book, One Free Man's War and the Second American Revolution, I recount my direct activities with the Montana Freeman. I devote at least a couple chapters to that activity, dealing with these folks in um, uh, the couple of trips that I made up there to, to meet with them, plus the time that I spent with uh, Russ and Dana in Denver getting involved in common law court issues, dealing with SWAT teams, local uh, Bureau of Investigation, tracking, standoffs, all kinds of activity in the, uh, in the local Colorado area uh, in other situations that I was personally involved in. So you might find that interesting. So I will leave you with a trailer video on the book to give you a little more insight on that. And with that, I will bid you adieu. Here's the trailer.